This is LLSA 2021 for Emergency Medicine. The article is Topical Transexemic Acid Compared with Anterior Nasal Packing, Good Times, for the Treatment of Epistaxis in Patients Taking Antiplatelet Drugs. It's a randomized controlled trial by Zahed et al. And Salim, I feel like we get TXA studies for epistaxis coming at us constantly. The things that I want to point out on this one that kind of piqued my interest was A, anterior nasal packing sucks, so I want to try to avoid that as much as possible. And then B, this one really kind of looked at a subset of patients, those taking antiplatelet drugs. Yeah, I mean, that's those are the patients that are the hardest, the ones that are taking anticoagulation and antiplatelet drugs. And this study specifically looked at antiplatelet drugs. And yeah, I mean, anybody who's had to deal with this in the ER knows this is, it's a tough thing. And that's why we have so many tools in our armamentarium to, to be able to deal with it. And this is a, a really focused niche group, like you said. Um, I think we should start maybe with talking about TXA itself and how it works. I, you know, we throw it around because it's like such a darling medication. It stops everything mm -hmm. that bleeds. Um, but maybe we don't think a little bit about how it exactly works. And it's essentially an anti-fibrinolytic drug that reduces plasmin concentration. And it does this by blocking the binding site of plasminogen. And that in turn inhibits the binding of plasminogen to fibrin. And then the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. And plasmin is ultimately what interferes with platelet function and reduces platelet adhesion and aggregation. So that's how it essentially works is it binds to plasminogen and doesn't allow that plasmin to kind of reduce that platelet aggregation. Now, this study was a randomized clinical trial, like you said, and it compared topical tranexemic acid with anterior nasal packing. And anybody who's put this in a patient knows they, they hate getting nasal packing. It just, it hurts. I mean... I've, I've made grown men cry by putting packing <laughs> in. And the, the specific antiplatelet drugs they looked at were aspirin, clopidogrel, or taking both, so dual antiplatelet therapy. And anterior nasal packing can usually be considered for the management of epistaxis. However, complications include, as we've already said, discomfort. You take it out, you remove the clot that's already been formed, then they start re-bleeding. Um, they can get adhesions between the two opposing mucosal surfaces. So it's not a benign thing either. It's not that it's just painful, but it can also cause bad things. Now, TXA has potential benefit. It's cheap. It's readily available. And I think a lot of us have started applying this into the management of epistaxis, at least somewhere along the way. It's either a first step, a second step, or third step. It's somewhere in that ABC of your plan to get this epistaxis to stop. So definitely a, a very important study to look at. Now, this was performed in two academic emergency departments in Iran, and they basically looked at 500 milligrams in 5 mLs of TXA compared to the anterior nasal packing. And I'll talk specifically about what they did for each one, because it's kind of a little bit different than what you would expect. Now, who did they include? Well, people who had acute, new, or recurrent anterior epistaxis and were currently taking either aspirin, clopidogrel, or both with persistent bleeding after 20 minutes of nasal compression. Now, Matt, when's the last time you held 20 minutes of compression on somebody's nose for <laughs> epistaxis? You know, I never hold their nose. I tell them to hold it, and I tend to see that they cut off at about 10 minutes. Like, you ask for that extra 10, and they just get bored. Nobody ever goes 20 minutes, but that's what they did in this study. So kudos to them for being able to get the patients to hold their nose for 20 minutes. Now, who did they exclude? So traumatic epistaxis was excluded if they're using anticoagulants. So we're not looking at people on anticoagulation type medications. If they had like inherited bleeding and platelet disorders, um, INR greater than 1.5, they were in hemorrhagic shock. There was a visible vessel that was bleeding, history of renal disease, and then lack of consent. So again, super niche population, right? These are people who come in with a nosebleed on antiplatelet meds, not in extremis, not due to trauma. Now, the TXA group, this is where it gets kind of interesting what they did. 15 centimeter cotton pledget. 15 centimeters, yeah. Matt. Okay. That's sizable. 
<laughs> I mean, that, that almost sounds like anterior That's nasal packing by like, itself. Exactly. But 15 centimeter cotton pledget soaked in 500 milligrams and 5 mLs of TXA, and they crammed that into the nostril. So that was the topical TXA arm, okay? Now, the anterior nasal packing group was the same 15 centimeter cotton pledget soaked in epinephrine and lidocaine, inserted into the affected nostril and left in place for 10 minutes. So they held pressure for 20 minutes, that didn't work. Then they put this sucker in for 10 minutes. Then they took several more cotton pledgets, covered them in tetracycline, packed into that nostril, and they left it in place for three days. I mean, this just doesn't sound uh, yeah. like fun at all. No, no, that sounds like the old school anterior nasal packing. <laughs> so these aren't these like kind of common commercial, you know, devices we have like rhino rockets and things like that. This was literally old school cotton pledge. It's just like crammed into the nostril. Now, if you were allocated uh, to the TXA group and it failed, then the next step was cautery. And then finally, anterior nasal packing was kind of the final pathway for that. And then for the anterior nasal packing group, it was just cautery alone was the next kind of final step. Now, they assessed for ongoing bleeding like every five minutes after both treatments. And after the patient left the ED, they followed up with them at 24 hours in one week. They did most of this over the telephone. They did do some in person, but a lot of it was like, hey, has your nose bled again in the last 24 hours or in the past week? So primary outcome, um, I think we all like this primary outcome. It's the proportion of patients in each group whose bleeding had stopped at 10 minutes. So yeah, I mean, 20 minutes of pressure, 10 minutes, we're talking 30 minutes total here, right? So they wanted to see if they could get the bleeding to stop. And I think that's important. Secondary outcomes was how often did they have recurrence of their epistaxis at 24 hours in one week? What was their ED length of stay? And then their patient satisfaction score on a scale of zero to 10. Now, they were looking for an 80% power to detect a difference of 25% between groups. So to be statistically significant, it had to show 25% difference. So did they show that? And the answer is yes. Bleeding stopped within 10 minutes in 73% of the TXA group versus 29% in the anterior nasal packing group. This was an absolute difference of 44%. If we look at the median time to cessation of bleeding in the TXA and the anterior nasal packing groups, 10 minutes for the TXA group, 15 minutes for the uh, anterior nasal packing respectively. Here's some of the other secondary outcomes. So re-bleeding at 24 hours, 5% uh, for TXA, 10% for anterior nasal packing. Re-bleeding at one week, 5% for the TXA, 21% for the anterior nasal packing. ED length of stay. So 97% of patients in the TXA group were discharged within two hours. I think that's a number we all would like. It was 13% for the anterior nasal packing group within two hours. So again, a significant difference there. And then when we look at the patient satisfaction, like their median satisfaction score, patients in the TXA group obviously said nine out of 10. Yeah, I was really satisfied with the higher number being more satisfied. And for the anterior nasal packing, shocker, it was a four out of 10 in the anterior nasal packing group. I, I probably would have been closer to a one if I was in that group. Yeah. I mean, these are the clinical outcomes that matter to us. Like you said, I like that short period of time. I like that that 10 minute uh, uh, reassessment and patient satisfaction because that's, that's where I lose the satisfaction of my job is when the patient's upset and I'm like causing them pain. And so it's an important one. Yeah, I mean, these are all like it checks all the boxes, right? It checks all the boxes of the things that we want to make patients happy with and also have good clinical endpoints. So I thought they did a good job in selecting these. And, you know, the good news is whether you got TXA or anterior nasal packing, there was no statistical difference in any adverse outcomes. So there was no serious adverse events in either group. So that's always good to see that as well. So Matt, you know, it's like we said, basically the advantages of topical TXA in this study population demonstrated quicker hemostasis, shorter ED length of stay, lower recurrence rate, and increased patient satisfaction. I mean, what else could you ask for? <laughs> I mean, I think it's going to be nice to see in the future, because I know there's going to be more TXA studies, Celine. This is not going away for epistaxis, 
But going back to your initial point, like, okay, well, what if I'm using a, you know, commercial product for my interior packing? And what if I don't use the 15 centimeter long pledget for my TXA? Something that might be a little more clinically relevant to my practice, uh, at least here in the United States, in terms of less packing and those commercial products. Because I can't remember the last time that I did the old school nasal packing for these patients. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I did a nasal packing either. Um, what's interesting in this study is 15 centimeter cotton pledget. I mean, they're essentially packing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and so you want you got to wonder how much of that is TXA and how much of that was just the pressure from the 15 centimeter pledget in this study. Um, I don't think we have a really good answer. And I think why we're going to see more studies coming out on this is because there are some nuances to this trial. But again, kudos to the authors. Um, so I think the next thing here is let's get into some of the discussion. So TXA, you know, it comes in a lot of forms. It, it's available in PO, IV, topical, nebulized. I mean, like you said, there's just like hundreds and hundreds of studies coming out looking at different medical conditions. And we've seen this now in epistaxis. We've seen it in sinus surgery. We've seen it in adenoidectomy. We've seen it in postpartum hemorrhage. We've seen it in trauma. We've seen it in hemoptysis now. I mean, there's just so many formulations and people are just like, adding TXA to anything that bleeds. Now, topical now TXA- Now we're seeing it with antiplatelet drugs. I like and, it. And now, let's just, let's exactly. And now we're seeing it with- specific. Yeah, well, now we're getting even more like specific. So topical TXA, it's been shown to be beneficial for gingival bleeding and in hemophiliac patients and for pulmonary hemorrhage from various etiologies. There's like little studies here and there and case series that have shown that. But this is the first trial, like you said, that's really shown a benefit of topical TXA in patients on antiplatelet agents. And so, again, I, I think it's an important population. They're some of the more difficult ones to get the bleeding to stop. So anytime we look at a study, there's certainly limitations we have to look at. We want to be objective in the way that we analyze that study. So posterior epistaxis was not included in this study. So you can't extrapolate the results of this study to a patient who's got a posterior bleed. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is that unfortunately the authors didn't break these patients into aspirin alone, clopidogrel alone, or taking both together. And it would have been nice to have some of that granular detail because maybe we would have seen a more beneficial effect in one versus the other. In this study, they just kind of lumped them all together. The third thing is, is that there was just no formal scale to grade epistaxis. So they used just a practical marker where they looked at continued bleeding at 20 minutes after nasal pressure was used. I think that's reasonable, but as we said at the beginning, I don't think we're asking these patients to hold their noses for 20 minutes, much less are the patients willing to hold their noses for 20 minutes. So this could have led to like an imbalance in severity of the bleeding between the two groups. And the authors even go on to say that if you had a history of epistaxis, this could be a marker for more severe bleeding and a higher proportion of patients with a history of epistaxis were in the TXA group. And so the beneficial effects that we're even seeing in this study could even be underestimated because of that fact, but just something to kind of keep in mind. And then we've already said this multiple times. I mean, they used old school cotton pledgets. They didn't use commercial epistaxis tamponade devices. And so we might see different outcomes if we saw the use of these commercial devices. So I think these are all just important limitations to kind of consider. Awesome, Selene. Well, I think, you know, TXA is still going to be in my list, like you said, my ABC list. And I'm not taking it out because the side effect profile is low and it's almost like a free shot for me. And if I can avoid the packing, well... That's what I'm trying to do in the first place, other than obviously stopping the bleed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think it's going anywhere in my armamentarium either. Um, I don't think the way that they did it in this study is exactly the way I'm doing it clinically, but hey, it's useful information. It shows that it does work for this niche population. This is Hippo Education.